Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Wanted Podcast. My name is John, and I'm with my partner, Alex. That's me. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we've been talking about doing this for a while, right? Yeah, yeah. We've been, uh, well, you know, we've been guest on a few podcasts, and um, honestly, we've had, had a lot of people ask us to do it. So um, We always have fun when we do it, too. It's always like after, you know, we talk to friends and, and like our friend LJ or Ben and Jason, of course, and afterwards like man that was a lot of fun we should do that more often and so the next logical conclusion was here we are yeah absolutely um ben and jason from skill set magazine reached out to us and uh you know mentioned they were starting a podcast network and that they would like for us to be on it and we were like well we have no excuses now <laughs> exactly you know sometimes you just need that nudge um alex and i if you don't know we own Fenrir recovery we are bail bondsman here in the Atlanta area and uh, for those of you who don't know we do bail recovery fugitive recovery also known as bounty hunting bounty hunting we are essentially we are bounty hunters now we there, are there's no candy coating it you know it's like the garbage man who calls himself a sanitation engineer we're fucking bounty hunters I I, well, you just, I think it's its better to put it in simple terms. I mean, not everyone is going to know what bail enforcement agent or bail recovery agent means. Most yeah. people have at least heard of of uh, bounty hunters. Yeah, from it, very true. Television shows or whatever. So That's right. Yeah, so we are bounty hunters. And uh, you know what, though? I, I never introduce myself as a bounty hunter, like at parties or anything. I'm a... I always say, oh, I'm feels a bail like bondsman. a Halloween costume. Right? I always feel corny. <laughs> you know, I feel like it's kind of corny. If you're like, what do you do? Oh, I'm a bounty hunter. I'm like, they're like, really, dude? You know, like, I, it just seems, well, there's not that many of us really either. So it, 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 it's it's not common. Most people don't know that we even exist. Yeah, yeah. No, I wish, I actually wish there was a way to like gather data on like how many bounty hunters there are in the United States. I, I, I would. A lot. But not a lot that work. <laughs> no, well, yeah. Well, I would also say not in, not a lot in relation to other careers. Like That's true. You That's know. true. Yeah, in relationship to other careers. You know, if you go to a school, an elementary school, there might be 75 school teachers. In this entire state of Georgia, there might be 75 bounty hunters. And probably of that, probably 10 that really work. Yeah, absolutely. That, that put in the work. And we'll talk about that in, in depth about uh, what it takes to be a bounty hunter or what makes a successful bounty hunter. Um, you know, I got started in in, uh, in bail recovery, bounty hunting, uh, five years ago, and uh, I was doing personal security for some families, PSD work, uh, another job, you know, bodyguard. I hate saying that bullshit, but I was doing PSD work for some families in the Atlanta area, and uh, one of the families I knew knew a bail bondsman and said, oh, he's looking for someone to do his recovery, and I didn't really know what that meant. I was like, what? You know, I, he's like, like, you know, bounty hunting. I was like, oh, like that guy on TV, right? And that, that's all I knew. You know, that's, that's, that was my experience with bounty hunting. I didn't, yeah, I, I think it's, I think that's probably the most common experience. Yeah, you're like, oh, like that guy on TV? I'm like, well, I don't know. You know, maybe. I don't even know what it is. So I took the class. And here in Georgia, it's an eight-hour class. It's not like it's, you know, going out to get an undergraduate degree in criminal justice. It's an eight-hour class to become a bondsman. And, uh, there's no separate bail recovery class in there. So I took the class, but halfway through, the, the, the teacher is a bondsman himself. He pulled me aside and said, hey, John, uh, I, I like you. You're, you know, I, I, let, talk to me after class. Let's, let's get something going here. And shoot, he hired me right then and there. You know, at the end of the day, I had files, which is rare. Yeah, very rare. That's not a common experience. Um, e even in the course of doing this job, we've had another a number of people who have reached out to us and kind of tried to get into the industry and uh, it's tough for most of them. It is tough. I mean, I, I, within four hours, five hours of, of stepping foot in the door, I had a job, which like, like Alex alluded to, it's very rare. I would get people daily in my DMs or messages or in emails to our business that uh, are asking, how do I do it? I want to do what you do. And, and it's it's hard. It's it just hard well. Work. You have to consider that there's a lot of liability involved. Right. Yeah. They're not going to hire just anyone, and there's not that much work. And bondsmen, once they got someone they like, they're not gonna they're not gonna like they're gonna play it pretty close. You, they've got to give you power of attorney. They're, they they are untrusting to say the least. And once they get someone they like, they don't let them go. Yeah. Exactly. So I got these files, 
and I probably found every single one of them like the first week, just like that. <laughs> just, just like that. It's so easy. <laughs> no, man, I could tell you, and you'll hear it over and over on this podcast that catching is easy. Finding is hard. If I roll up at your house and you're on the property, it's your ass. I mean, it's already, it's, it's been settled. You're going to jail. I mean, I, we don't, no one runs on it, gets away running. No one barricades themselves in or goes the hard way and doesn't go. But it's it just, that's the easy part. The hard part is finding. And so back in the day, five years ago, I guess, it was, I probably had 10 files and I found five or six of them right off the bat. But they were easy. In retrospect, they were easy. And for me to catch you back then, you had to be a dumb motherfucker, man. I was like, I'd drive by their house. If they were mowing their lawns, I'd jump out and tackle them or whatever. <laughs> I mean, that's about, that was about the extent of my private investigating, you know, my skip tracing skills. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Yeah, though I do remember one, uh, actually one really good story. And this is, this is in retrospect, good tradecraft on your part. Uh, you went and sat outside uh, a woman's house. She lived with her parents, remember? And you called them and you told them you were going to be coming to the house later looking for her. That's right. And she ran outside and you caught her in the driveway. You know what? That <laughs> like was... I said, looking back, I'm like, damn, that was actually a pretty good, pretty good tactic. Right, like Trojan horse. <laughs> yeah, I sat outside of her house and uh, I didn't, I, I knew her car, uh, but I didn't even know how to read a file then. And in, in hindsight, yeah. I didn't know what I was doing, man. I was sitting out there. And I'm like, well, I think that's her car, but I'm not sure. That's her parents' house. Someone told me she hangs out there. So I called the parents and said, hey, is she there? Well, I'm going to come over to come talk to you. And sure as shit, man, <laughs> that door opened up, and that woman came running out. You know what's funny? I'll digress again for a second. That was that big girl. Remember that? It was a really big girl. And then she got arrested again. She was like in Gwinnett County top Ten or so, like most wanted fugitives. Oh, that's late, funny. At a later date, yeah, she's in and out. She can't stay out of jail. That's funny. But so I, I'm working these files, and I come into just a brick wall, man. I, uh, I there's like four of them, five of them. I don't know that. I just did not have any idea. And I knew Alex from a Krav Maga self-defense class. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of where I came in. He and I had met at a Krav Maga class, and uh, at the time, I was interested in private investigations work. Mm-hmm. I, I wanted to be a private investigator, skip tracer. And well, you I always had, did, right? Oh, like, yeah. I, that You know what? That's true. Going back to my childhood, I always wanted to be a detective, an investigator. And I think, uh, you know, actually coming out of high school, it didn't really seem like a viable career option. Right. I, I became a photographer because who becomes a detective or a bounty hunter or what? It just didn't seem, it seemed like a movie career, not a real life career. Right. It's like, oh, I want to be an astronaut and a wizard or some shit. Yeah. Yeah. I just didn't, it didn't seem realistic. So, um, you know, here I am years later, uh, and interested in getting into that type of a field. And I had expressed that to John and just in training together and so I was fortunately the first person that he reached out to and he was like hey you know I don't know I know you don't really have any experience but why don't you take these files and see if you can find these people you know just kind of dip your foot in the water a little bit and so I took the files and just started digging and I was able to find all of them uh yep. they were all people who had run out of state you know he had kind of exhausted his local resources found them all out of state and at that point i think we realized that we had complementary skill sets we were like oh this thing could actually work absolutely i mean it was intuitive for you i mean i gave you the files and within a couple of days i mean you knew exactly where they all were it was, it was cool i was like wow okay so you know, wonder twin powers activate. And <laughs> so, and, but it's still like that today though. I mean, it's a little bit of an overstatement to say that you're the skip, the skip tracer and I'm the bounty hunter. Cause we both do, I do investigations and you do field work, but our skill sets are, are still fall in line kind of along those, along those parameters. Um, I got, I'm at the door. Alex is at the back door, making sure someone doesn't squirt. Whenever we're conducting interviews or there's an investigation going on, Alex takes the lead on that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I'm constantly on my phone 
I mean, you would think that I did most of my skip tracing from a laptop. And that's <laughs> nice when we're in the office. Right. But most of the time, most of our time, we spend in the field, in the car, uh, you know, out looking for people. And so the vast majority of my skip tracing happens on my phone. That's right. So, you know, from that point. I swear to God, I was thinking the other day, I feel like I'm going to end up with like carpal tunnel or something from holding it. Oh, I know. Like man. it'll, my hand, this is like such a millennial thing to say, but like my hand will actually get sore from <laughs> holding the way I have to hold my phone. Yeah. But it's just because I'm spending hours on it, skip tracing in the field. Yeah. Well, thankfully, I can't imagine doing this job before you had, you know, the internet in your hand and, and the ability I to make like phone I feel like we need calls. to do an episode on that. On, on bounty hunting before, uh, when you had to have a road map, a pocket full of quarters, and a pay phone. And yeah, or MapQuest. Yeah, MapQuest. I still <laughs> don't talk shit on MapQuest. I love MapQuest. You're such an old man. I am an old man. So together we make Fin Rear Recovery. We do, uh, we are bail bondsmen, but we don't write bonds. We are contractors, mercenaries, uh, for probably 14, 15 different offices, mm -hmm. maybe one more now, I think someone's calling to get on board. Um, and we do all their pickups. And so how bail works is... Uh, Alex, so, I ahead. think it's a good thing to go into and kind of go over, you know, how the bail process works right at the beginning, because we're going to be telling a lot of stories probably over right. the course of this, this podcast. And I think it's good to kind of have some uh, like establishing knowledge, some... right foundational we, knowledge especially if you're the type of person who is not familiar if with you've had the, the good process. fortune to <laughs> if you've had the good fortune to never have a bail bondsman in your life then uh this is for you um a lot of people have had bail bondsmen and it's important to note now that just because you've been pinched by the law doesn't mean you're a bad person or a criminal it just means that you got pinched by the law man shit it's, happens it shit happens and again because you've been arrested doesn't mean you've been convicted either. So just because you're on bail or have to work with a bail bondsman doesn't mean that you're some kind of mass murderer or on some criminal you know, spree. It just means you got pinched, man, and, and, and that you're doing your part in, in the legal process. Um, Alex describes it best, I think, as bail bonds are is a short-term loan that you pay a one-time premium on where the bail bondsman loans money to the court on your behalf so you can get out of jail and await trial free until your court date comes. Yeah, I think that's the simplest way to put it. Uh, most of the time, the you know the, the premium is always paid up front right. uh, at the time of the bond. And here in Georgia, legally, it, uh, it is required to be between 10 and 15% of the bond amount. Right. Um, so it like can't a, be more and it can't be less. Like a $10,000 bond. The judge says, oh, drunk driving, $10,000. And you don't have 10000 to get out. You pay a bondsman $1,500 and he loans that balance to the courts on your behalf so you can be free until your court date. Exactly. And, um, you know, the bondsman keeps the fee. That's his profit. He's got to make money somehow. Cost of doing business. Cost of doing business. Cost of, you know, whatever nonsense you were getting up man. to. Or yep. <laughs> yeah, you know what? It's it's the cost of business. You know, it's it's it, you're paying that money because the bondsman is making a loan on your behalf. And you can't borrow money from the bank or anything like that. The other only way you get out without a bondsman is if you have all the cash. Sometimes if you have property or sometimes on little bonds, like a like half ounce of weed, they might just kick you on OR, which is own recognizance, and you just come back on your own time. Yeah, exactly. Um, it is worth noting, though. I've 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 actually heard people say, you know, I had the the full cash amount to put down on the bond, but I used a bondsman instead because. I didn't know how long, like what the kind of bureaucratic process was going to be to get my money back after the case was disposed. That, that's, that's, that's smart. That's playing the long money right there because they tie your money up. Yeah. You know, they're, your money's going to be tied up to your case is disposed, right? Till your case is all over with, with a guilty plea, with a not guilty, with it being just not even, they drop the charges or whatever, your money's tied up. So a bondsman is a smart, is, is smart to use. Yeah. So the so how we get involved in that is, say you do have that ten thousand dollar bond and you pay your fifteen percent. If you go to court and the case gets disposed, that's it, no harm, no foul. The bond says thanks for the fifteen hundred bucks. You go and live your life. 
if you don't go to court, that's how Alex and I get involved. Exactly. If you fail to appear in court, and it's worth noting for future reference that uh, we call that an FTA, failure right. to appear, but FTA is a term that you will hear us use a lot. So again, yeah. some ins- Part of our kind, kind of there. establishing knowledge. Um, if you fail to appear in court, the vast majority of the time, the judge will issue a bench warrant and you will become a fugitive until you are either arrested on that warrant or you work uh, with the courts to get the warrant withdrawn. Right. It's a good point right here to let you know who does the arresting alex and i do alex and i do the arresting on behalf of the bail bondsman but what i'm gonna i'm gonna tell you that we're not cops that's what really fucking freaks people out is that we aren't cops if i ever get hate on social media or from really hardcore uh conservative people who are like just super pro cop this and that mm-hmm. uh, it's because we're not cops yeah we are we are not law enforcement legally we're still private citizens right um we are not pr- afforded the protections of law enforcement right. um we are we are you know um in in the eyes of the law we're still private citizens but we we are given we are given a range of authority by you, the person on bond. Exactly. You know, during that bonding contract, that process that you pay the fifteen hundred dollars on, and so what you do is you sign a shitload of paperwork. You know, it's like a bond. It's a, like a loan application, mm-hmm. but it's got about four pages on the back side there of minuscule print that give that lets you that you sign away most of your Fourth Amendment rights, your right to privacy, your your right. Your, you give. You give us permission to come arrest you for you to have to pay for any expenses of recovery, including doors or broken windows or as whatever well that is. As well as our fees. As well as our fees, travel, and the cost of our what we just charged. Also, um, your indemnitor, your cosigner, you know, the person that you have vouching for you, they're on the hook just as well. Yeah, and uh, that's one more thing worth mentioning about the process of using a uh, a for-profit bondsman, a cash bondsman, right. uh, the vast majority of the time, they're going to require a co-signer to serve as surety on your loan, on, on your bail bond, which once again, it's like the loan process. You know, if you have bad credit, the bank is going to want for you to get a co-signer. That's right. Um, so uh, the co-signer acts as surety for your bail bond. If you fail to appear in court, then they are going to have to just in case you wonder, that is the sound of John opening another beer. Hey, hey. <laughs> He's trying to hide it, but it's happening. I know. I was trying to be sneaky, sneaky about it, but there's no hiding it. Uh, maybe having a beer or four or something here. <laughs> so, yeah, the co-signer is liable for the full amount of the bond That's right. plus all recovery fees um, if you fail to appear in court. And we can't, if we can't find you, if we can't rearrest you and bring you back, the bondsman legally can pursue collections on the cosigner for that full amount. So, and um, you've already agreed to lose. <laughs> That's the crazy part, right? Lots of waivers. Lots of waivers. You sign away. You're like, oh, I just want to get my buddy out of jail, man. He's a good guy. I want to help him out. They're all signed. Where do I sign? And I'm not saying you don't sign for someone because obviously they need to get out. But I'm going to say if you're going to co-sign for someone. Uh, be judicious about it and make sure it's just not some bro of yours that you know from work sometimes because you are you are going to be responsible for all the fees. You're going to be responsible for the uh, the the bond amount, that $10,000 we're talking about in that one case. You're responsible yeah. for 10000 plus the fees. Um, it's kind of wild. And if you don't go to court, the first person we come talk to is the cosigner. Yeah, absolutely. So if you are going to co-sign for someone, just make sure you're uh, very confident that they're going to go to court. Right. Otherwise, you get us in your life. And uh, when, once we're in your life, because there's money involved, we don't stop. That's that's the difference, I think, between us and, uh, and, and, and well, I would say between, you know, it's just the libertarian coming out of me, of course. But I, I you'll see st- uh, statistically how effective bounty hunters are but it's because it's being driven by profit yeah absolutely i mean it's uh you know we we are commission based we work commission only so you know we're incentivized um in closing cases and again you know i won't say 
I want not law enforcement. They have very limited resources. That's and a tough I'm job, telling man. you, That's we, a tough job. we have we have spent weeks, months, months, definitely months on on cases that are small. Right. And law enforcement doesn't have the time or the resources to spend, right. uh, you know, working a small case. And so, you know, we are in a way, a non-subsidized warrants unit. And, yeah. and that's kind of... At no expense of, to the taxpayer, yeah. which is uh, it's the benefit of a for-profit bail is that that, that that premium people are paying, that 10 to 15% is paying for due process with no expense to the court or to law enforcement. Yeah, you'll have warrants teams go out and go after people once in a while, but for the most part, we do most of the pickups for people who fail to appear yeah and we don't have the uh, we we don't have the luxury of a giant department backing us up or a solicitor or da backing us up but at the same time we don't have our hands tied like cops do either because you've signed all that paperwork away we don't have to call a judge at two in the morning hey change the address on this warrant or any of that bullshit or i'm off at five o'clock so i've got to pull off surveillance at four that's not how we do. You know, it's there's money involved. We're out there getting after it. And that sounds crazy, but it's fucking America, baby. That's like <laughs> that's like fucking hell, man. We've how many we've gone we were on the road last year like five days now in Florida, like three different towns for pickups. And we only used like a hotel like twice. The other time we were in the car, taking shifts, mm-hmm. working, surveillance, driving. That when there's money involved, you get after it. You know, that's, that's the beauty of capitalism right there. And, you know, it's – bail bonds is a uniquely American thing now, but it, it hasn't always been that way, right? It started, what, back in the day in, in, in pre-colonial America, like all the way back in England, right? Back yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the, the notion of bail um, can be traced back to ancient Rome, but kind of the our current – bail in its current form, our current understanding of – of bail has Anglo-Saxon roots. So um, just to go into a little bit of the history of bail bonds, honestly, I didn't know a lot of this stuff until I started doing research for the podcast. And I feel like because it's my job, I probably should have known more. <laughs> You're the researcher. Um, but uh, it's uh, actually, it's all been really interesting to me. I've enjoyed researching it. In fact, I'd, I'd love to go back and do some podcast going more in depth on some of these like the people and the you know, right like. right but it's a, i i like the idea of it you know the the notion of a police force run by the government is relatively new yeah so then that's actually that's right where i start so in medieval england criminal justice was um, mostly a private affair and like our current you know state run system I like that i'm not gonna lie <laughs> And um, the the medieval Anglo-Saxon legal process was first created as an alternative to blood feuds. <laughs> also known as my <laughs> family Thanksgiving. <laughs> Not making that up. Alternative to blood feuds. I mean, they were like, there was like legitimate mob justice and, and it was allowed. I mean, there was a process called hue and cry and it allowed the public to hunt down and deliver summary justice to offenders that like tor- full torch and pitch pitchfork kind of justice. And then they realized, you know, like maybe the they Frankenstein should, movie, right? They maybe, all kind of surround your castle. Exactly. And, burn the shit down. Um, and they're like, you know what? Maybe this is a bad idea. And, you know, maybe there should be some sort of a process here. Um, so so as a, a legal process began to develop, and again, this is like, you know, medieval England, so this is not like every village is kind of doing it differently, and there's no, it's not really codified, but um, the, the primary criminal penalty was just remuneration. They just wanted you, you did someone wrong, you paid the money to make Almost up for it. Almost everything was, you could be handled civilly. Exactly. It was all, it was like, the settlement process today. Well, a lot of the um, countries around the world still do that, right? You know, oh, you ran my kid over with your car. I'll take this much livestock or money. It's still done like that in some countries. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so these these payments to compensate grievances were called bots, and as that as that process developed, they realized, you know, it became a concern that the accused person might flee to avoid paying the bot. 
So this whole system was created where the defendant was required to find a surety, and the surety would be responsible for guaranteeing the defendant's appearance in court and uh, also guaranteeing the payment of the bot if the defendant did not appear in court. Right. So I like that. Well, it's at the time, the surety, you know, like now, you have to pay the if the person fails, the defendant fails to appear, the cosigner is liable for the bond amount. But didn't they used to like, at one point, you could be held liable that you had to, if you co sign for someone back in the day, like we're talking hundreds of years ago, um, medieval times, that you had to also serve the punishment? Yeah, well, again, going back to it wasn't really codified, right? So, you know, different villages, different sheriffs, they all did it differently. Right. And they're, they're, um, there have been, you know, they they found like historical references to your surety actually having to serve the time for you or take your place as defendant if you fail to appear. So slightly higher stakes for cosigners back in the day. <laughs> yeah, I read that. That's why I brought up. I read about that, and I was like, holy shit! Could you imagine if that was the case now? No one would cosign. No one would no. cosign. Or, but imagine the leverage we would have over someone, right? You know, during the investigative process, someone doesn't go to court. We call our cosigner. We're like, hey, where's Junior at? They're like, oh, I don't know. You're like, that's cool. I'm taking you to jail instead. They're like, that motherfucker's in the shed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, he's in the shed right now hiding from you. Yeah, we yeah. No, no, you are correct. Like that was uh, that was that was definitely Some uh, fucking a leverage thing. right so, there, man. Uh, criminal justice gradually become became more state run. And as that happened, Instead of just requiring money, you know, these bots, these settlements to compensate grievances, um, capital and corporal punishment began replacing fines for all offenses but very minor ones. And the length of time between trial and accusation, like, lengthened. So, (laughs) what do you think happened? Punishments become worse, and the length of time between accusation and trial gets longer that's like incentivizing people to flee right absolutely and you had traveling magistrates and everything there exactly. wasn't exactly there right you know you have to wait two months for the magistrate to come back around to your your county so to speak right you know and so the sweep will just take off and it wasn't like they could just track people down on ncic or run a computer check on them yeah, you, know, you run out of town, cut your hair, and you go from Dave to Bob, and no one knows who the fuck you are ever again. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Um, so this, you know, this instigated a number of problems, you know, inconsistencies from county to county to the, to the traveling magistrates, um, corruption, of course, you know, they're always corruption because human beings are involved if human beings are involved there's going to be corruption it's not it's just, just fail <laughs> it happens everywhere yeah if anything if anything money's involved it, there's going to be some fucking there's, going on exactly um so finally it was all codified in the statue of westminster and i want to say that was 1295 i forgot to write it down in my notes but but sometime uh 1275 1295 sometime around then um all the, the the whole the full bail process was all codified and then it pretty much stayed the same for the next like 500 years right so and and then you know um there were there were a few additions along the way and you know it's funny because this reflects uh you know current uh legislation in the united states uh to prevent long delays before a bond hearing right um but it was mostly the same up all the way up until colonial times right so Colonial times, 1776, we tell the UK, we tell England to fuck themselves, right? We're branching out. We're moving on up on our own. And uh, up until then, like in, you know, I'd say, you know, 17th century, 16th century, we were kind of doing things the UK way. Traveling magistrates, kind of, you know, pitchfork-wielding villagers that would lock someone up and say, oh, wait till the justice comes around, and they would do what they had to do. Uh, during... After 1776, you know, we, we declare our independence from England, uh, write the Bill of Rights, and in the Eighth Amendment, I didn't even know this, man, until I, I, mean, I felt like an idiot for not, because everyone always knows the First Amendment, you know, your right to free speech, and, you know, Second Amendment, of course, our right to, uh, to bear arms, but the Eighth Amendment actually makes reference to bail, that you can't have a, I think the word, it should not be uh, 
bail shall not be excessive. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. I didn't even know that. They were thinking about it back in the day, right? And uh, so bail, after the Bill of Rights, it shall not be excessive. Um, it's pretty much spot on, right? So it's they've codified it. Mm-hmm. But what happens is around 18... Uh, in 1789, the Judiciary Act, lawyers start getting involved, right? And like most things, everything kind of starts getting a little bit more fucked up. So lawyers get involved, and then they start giving judges more leeway it 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 is it kind of convolutes the bail process and it starts to get not corrupt but it gets a little wonky to the point where certain people uh i'd say disadvantaged marginalized people don't get as fair a shake as people who have money right you know if you could afford a lawyer and you had a uh, you had money you could get out on bail and and get better uh, better treatment in the justice system and that goes all the way on and it kind of lines up with the uh, civil rights act so as i just alluded to uh marginalized uh populations uh people who have been uh disenfranchised poor people you know bail have affected them more negatively than people who have a lot of money you know think white collar crime a guy who's a millionaire gets you know, a big crime. They're saying, oh, it's a $100,000 bond. He posts it and walks out in the afternoon. And someone who has no money, you know, has n- no money, no source of income. They're living in poverty, and they have a $1,000 bond. They don't have $200 to post. And, right. and so they sit till the trial date. And then the negative consequences of being in, tr- in jail for those two months. And remember, this isn't convicted. This is still alleged alleged crime that they're right. charged with. So uh, the Bail Reform Act of 66 comes around. And like I said, it's no, uh, it's not a coincidence that kind of lines up the American Civil R- Rights Act, right? Mm-hmm. So the Civil Rights Act uh, in America. So it gets tighter then and, and becomes more fair to the general population. I think bail in America at that point kind of falls in line where most people are getting a pretty fair shake. And that comes... All the way up to here, to where we are now. There's some bail reform stuff going on, and rightfully so. Um, we'll talk about that at a latter date. But it's also important to know that through all this time, bounty hunters have always been in part of the process, from the pre-colonial times all the way up to current. Obviously, with us, um, most like I said before, I started doing this job. I didn't know bounty hunters existed, and just in doing research the unique history of it. And I was like, God, there's some really cool people that used to be bounty hunters. Um, of course, I think the most famous of which everyone knows every, not every day, but what, how many days a week when we're on the job, do people ask us about these two people uh, when we're on the, on the field? Oh, all the time, all the time. But you know what? I, I get it. I get it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's, uh, I get it as well. And I'm, I'm, we're talking, of course, about Dog and Beth Chapman, right? Uh, Dwayne. Yeah, Dog the Bounty Hunter. How, probably whenever we're in the field, probably four or five days a week, at least two or three days a week, someone's like, oh, you're like that guy, Dog. I'm like, well, kind of, same job. Now, I'm not Dwayne. He's a good guy. We've met him. He's a great fucking guy. Yeah. And and Beth is amazing, too. She's powerful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, she's been right alongside him the whole time. All the um, way, man. But, you know, I think I think the best part about Dog the Bounty Hunter and the biggest favor that he has done for bail recovery and for the bail bonds industry is that he has brought it into the public eye. And it gives people a point of reference when they see us in their house or on their street or in their place of employment. And they're looking at us and looking at what we're wearing and the gear we have on and they're like okay I don't think you're a cop what are you and so when we say I'm a bail recovery agent I'm a bail bondsman whatever they say so many people say oh you're like dog and I like it when that happens because I'm like okay good now you now you you understand yeah you get it I don't have to explain what I do to you that and you know why I'm here obviously because someone in your orbit has failed to go to court um yeah it's I have no hate for that. I mean, it's popular amongst, you know, bail recovery guys. Oh, this, you know, dog, the show so unreal. I don't think so. 
I've watched a couple episodes, and and if it's got to be jammed into like twenty five minutes. I was gonna say it's a, it's an extremely condensed version of the bail recovery process, but I, it's accurate. They they are legit bail bondsmen. They own their own company. They yeah. write bonds. They, they write, pick people up. Exactly, and and we had we got to meet uh, Dwayne and Beth out in Vegas a couple of years back. And I have to say, they were super sweet. Man. Yeah, very authentic. Very authentic. I have to say, you know, you see him on TV, and he's got that hair and the way he dresses and stuff. In real life, fucking A, if he doesn't dress just like that. Yeah. Like, yeah. nowhere, no camera crews around, no TV. And we're walking through a Las Vegas casino together, and that dude's wearing the sunglasses and the big hair and got the shirt and the pointy cowboy boot. He's, he's like that all the time. Yeah, yeah. But powerful. S- powerful look. But uh, super sweet, though. I mean, super. Ge- I, I guess the word I like to use for him is like, what? Uh, genuine. Yeah, very genuine. Yeah, I- genuine guy, man. He was like, he, you know, we shook hands. He gave me a little hug at the end. He's like, hey, man, you be careful out there, John, you know. And he's just super sweet guy. Mm-hmm. And, and and she's smart, too. She was in charge of the – she was the president of our whole association. Yeah, still is. Yeah, yeah. yeah she's president of the professional The bondsman. National Bail Bond Association. So, yeah. Um, yeah, nothing bad to say about those two. No, not at all, man. I, I, and he's still in the game too. He's a little bit older, and he's still getting after it. You know, he's still working. He's still working. Um, you see, it's a popular thing in media, right? You have, you know, Boba Fett or Django or what's it, Domino, right? Yeah, Domino. Domino. So, um, I, I would say, uh, probably the most well-known female bounty hunter. Um, you know, aside uh, aside from Beth, uh, because mm-hmm. she does work in the field. She um, does. She is, does. Uh, was Domino Harvey, right. and um, you know she had a. She's played by Keira Knightley in a movie. There we go. That's pretty big, right? Yeah, there. pretty big. Was um, she in Pirates of the Caribbean? Was that yes. her? See, uh, I'm an old man. That You're man. old. You're old. I'm old. I'm like, what else was she? What else was she in? I'm getting. Uh. I don't know. She's been in a lot of like historic period pieces. Ooh, like, like Jane Austen movies. <laughs> yeah, that kind of stuff. <laughs> She's a Jane Austen actress. Uh, uh, yeah, she played Guinevere in uh, like a kind of uh, in cheesy King Arthur, King Arthur kind of movie. Nice. Um, but she was like, she was like wrapped in leather and like had a bow and arrow. Oh, come on now. Yeah, yeah, yeah nice. with Clive Owen. So. Um, Okay, Domino. so anyway, Domino <laughs> Harvey. Now I'm like, I'm thinking about Kira Knightley, like wrapped in strips of leather. I'm like, hello. <laughs> okay, <laughs> anyway, back on track. Uh, Domino Harvey, uh, she's born in 1969, and she's actually born in England. Her father was actor Lawrence Harvey, and her mom was a model named Pauline Stone. So um, she didn't do so bad on the genetic lottery. Right, lucky sperm club right <laughs> exactly. there. Exactly. Um, but her dad died when she was four years old, and her mom remarried. Her mom remarried actually the guy who started uh, the Hard Rock Cafe. Oh, he's the one to blame, <laughs> right? Those terrible T-shirts and twenty-dollar hamburgers. That's that's oh god. Anyway, anyway, so um, his uh, her, her mom remarried this guy and moved to the United States, and they sent Domino to boarding school, and. That, uh, she didn't take so well to boarding school. She got kicked out of four of them. That's how all those terrible, cheesy B-movies get made of, like, girls' boarding schools, right? Yeah, yeah, I know, right? She, But you know what? From what I understand, like, she would throw hands with about. the other girls there. So, but like anyway, she got kicked out of four boarding schools and <laughs> then did, uh, did some modeling in the UK, did some, like, really random jobs in the UK. And then in 1989, she moved to the United States. Okay. Um, and actually, this is interesting. I didn't know this about her. She actually worked as a ranch hand in, like, the I guess the mountains outside of San Diego. And that's where huh. she learned to shoot. Nice. And uh, she developed an affinity for guns. And then she was a firefighter and an EMT. Uh, and then finally ended up, uh, t- she took a class um, on, like, bail bonds and bounty hunting. In and California, she, right? Yeah, in California. And, and she became... A bounty hunter, and she worked for Celeste King Bail Bonds in L.A. Um, and uh, was, uh, from from what I've read, very good at it. Um, in fact, you know what? I have a quote right here directly from her old boss, and uh, I love what he said. You know, I, I've never seen the movie, but I know the name. And it's another name like Dog or Bath or whatever. People who throw it out, they're like, oh, Domino. Like, 
female bounty hunter. Yeah, exactly. So her old boss, uh, Celeste King, said uh, Domino is one of the best in the business. It can be a tough job, and not many women are up to it. Um, so, and it was really cool because she would do a lot of undercover stuff. She had an English accent, right? So right. she would like put on the lost tourist act and, uh, I guess kind of lure these people in and start talking to them. 1990s and, version of catfishing. Yeah, right? exactly. Um, you know, it certainly helped that she was, uh, you know, like six feet tall and drop dead beautiful. That didn't hurt her any. It doesn't hurt. Um, but uh, another quote from her, she said, if I was doing this for the money, I'd have stopped a long time ago. The real satisfaction is putting sleaze bags in jail. That's interesting. Yeah, which, which is really funny because moving on kind of to the, the next part of her story, um, she, for many years of her life, struggled with a drug problem. Right, I was going to say it's a little bit ironic for her to be like, oh, these scumbags. I'm like, hello. <laughs> yeah, so actually her... Um, I, I, her old partner, she worked with these two guys, and one of them said that they used to take the drugs from the fugitives Robin and Rip, do like, them. <laughs> <laughs> Robin and Rip and like Omar, right? Exactly. Um, so uh, anyway, she developed a drug problem. She had a really hard time kicking it. I think she went to rehab like four or five times. and um, That's in, brutal, man. Yeah, eventually in 2005, she was arrested on some really big charges like uh, distributing meth, trafficking, racketeering. She had a she one. She went mil- right to meth. Yeah. It was like it wasn't. She didn't stay up the stinky weed. You know, she was like, you know what? I'm all in. Yeah, yeah. She um, so she was given a million dollar bond. Holy she shit. posted it. Was put on an ankle monitor, and um, eventually uh, they found her one night dead in her bathtub and uh when they when they tested her she um tested uh she had fentanyl in her system right when right. she died She's ahead of the so times just a just a super you know tragic character when uh, did she die 2005 she actually died so i want to say she died in june of 2005 and the domino movie was released in october of 2005 so she was she never even saw the finished yeah, she product never, on it she never saw it i've kind of heard I've heard sources that said she was like really kind of uh, disdainful of the film project. And then I've read some others that say she was really excited about it. I can say having read, uh, you know, as much as I have about her life at this point that she, that the film is not an accurate portrayal of her life, but it's not meant to be. Right. Yeah. She's a a character, right? You know, it's Mm -hmm. based upon her. Yeah. I saw that. I I mean, I I never saw the movie with uh, Knightley in it. But just in reading about her, you know, just curious about her craft, uh, you know, she had the money. Her She moved in with her mom, right, in, in Beverly Hills. She had a Beverly Hills address. Yeah, and yeah. She lived. She actually lived um, above the garage at her mom's house because right. her mom, she loved AK-47s and Who she doesn't? loved shotguns. Who doesn't? My kind of woman. And, um, but her mom didn't want her to have guns in the house, so she had to live above the garage. That at all. <laughs> yeah, she needs to get over that. But, yeah, so... I read about her death. It was off. Like her mom had posted, obviously a million dollar bond, mm-hmm. and she's gonna be put into that thing for at least a hundred large, you know, probably a hundred and fifty close to it. Yeah. And her mom had the money and put her on an ankle monitor above the garage, and even hired her a sobriety coach. And <laughs> that's a job in California. They had a sobriety coach for her, and he's the one that found her dead body. Oh wow! I didn't I actually didn't read Fire that. Fire that really motherfucker! Sad. Yeah, it's terrible, but. Where was he at? <laughs> yeah, that's like, you're fired, dude. Yeah, yes, you have one job, but he didn't get after it. Uh, my favorite bounty hunter. Oh man, I, I there's this old dude. I'm gonna have to look him up in a second. But um, bounty hunting's been going on for so long, and it's been characterized in the movies. Um, and like I said before, I ever even took the job. If you would have asked me about bounty hunting. I would have thought about like uh, like Blood Meridian, like the judge and those guys bringing in scalps. You know, that was kind of my vision of it. There's this guy named uh, Mickey Free. That's my guy, man. He's uh, it's interesting. He's in the American West in the 19th century, and uh, he's a white dude. Well, he's he's half Mexican. He's a Mexican and Irish uh, mix, uh, and allegedly red hair. But when he's 12 years old fucking Apaches come steal him off his parents' house. 
like this is back in the late 19th century or not late, but you know, mid, uh, I'd say probably 1870, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. You know, he's 12 years old and, uh, he gets pinched. They, they steal him. They steal kids, right? So they, they take him and he's raised from the time he's like 12 to 18 by Apaches and they give him a new name and everything else. And he grows up as one of them. Like dances with wolves, right? He kind of becomes assimilated into them, their, uh -huh. into their culture. But when he turns eighteen, and the Indian Wars are going on, and the U.S. cavalry is in the American West, and they are out fighting Indians, uh -huh. Native Americans, First Nation people, and we're out there fucking breaking treaties and giving them smallpox <laughs> and fucking them up like no one's business, and an awful genocide of a people. He changes teams. He goes back to being on the U.S. side, and he becomes a cavalry scout. Right. So he's a, an Indian cavalry scout, but he's really a half Mexican, half white guy. But he goes and he works for the U.S. cavalry, like says a calf scout, not like a, one of those fruity new cavalry scouts, but like old school cavalry scout. And uh, his specialty is, you know, going after these guys. He's really good at it. Uh, but eventually the Indian Wars end. You know, that, that it all goes away. And uh, he's looking for work, so he knows. He's like, I have the skill set. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I have a unique ability. Uh, so what he does, he turns on the Native American people. I, I, I wouldn't say he turns, but he specializes in chasing Native American fugitives who are out on bond. Or back in the day, you used to be able to go out and pull the wanted poster down, right? You know, right. you go down and... This guy is wanted for cattle rustling. You take it and you catch the guy, bring him in and get the reward. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what he does. But his specialty is in catching Native American uh, offenders. Wanted persons. Wanted persons, which is crazy. This guy is half Mexican, half white. His real name is like Felix. Uh -huh. Like Felix Teles. He's like the most Mexican name ever. Uh -huh. But he's raised white by an Irish guy, but gets stolen by the Apache lives as an Apache, then becomes a scout for the white guys. And then after the war, you know, after the Indian Wars, goes after the Indians as a bounty hunter. And he, at one point, he picked up like a $15,000 bond, like a, a recovery back uh -huh. then, which in today's money is like I was going to say, adjusting for inflation, that's like, that's like over four hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> that is, I'm like, dude, man, fifteen thousand is a big. I, you tell me, I'm gonna make fifteen thousand dollars on a guy. I'm like, I'm in, dude. <laughs> yeah, I'm in. And this dude in 1890 pulled that shit off. Mm -hmm. um, but what's crazy to me, and I always like complicated people. Um, what's cool is this guy has, like I said, he's he's Mexican Irish, stolen by Apaches, then goes to work as a Cav Scout against any and then he becomes a bounty hunter but at the end of his life he has some kind of cathartic moment i'm not sure what happens but he moves back on the reservation and that's where he lives out his final years and dies like 1910 or something but and then like four wives later you know this guy must have been a super hard ass i can only imagine i mean this guy's lived a billion lives in his little lifespan but I, I like to imagine him. His wife's like, like, honey, you're never home. <laughs> yeah, you're always out getting scalps. <laughs> yes, that's right, baby. No, it's, uh, sorry, the scalps are calling. He's making that bank, too. He's chasing that $15,000 bounty. But what's crazy is he, um, he is stolen by Apaches, then as a calf scout, then as a bounty hunter, but he goes and he retires out and lives on the res for the rest of his years. And it's just be interesting how he kind of came to, to me, it's interesting to think about how he came to that point of his life, right? right? There must have been some kind of reckoning where he was like, oh, man, you know, this is, what am I doing? And he kind of settles down and, and, and lives it out. I think that'd been a cool dude to have some beers with, right? You're like, he, yeah, he you have to Yeah, you have to wonder if he finally, like, came to sort of uh, terms with or, like, found a peace with his identity in the end, you right, know? Right, right. I mean, that guy was all over the place, but... You know, that's a dude I would have had beers with and talked to and some great fucking stories, man. Uh, but, yeah, that's my guy, man. William, F or I'm sorry, Mickey Free was his name. Yeah, that's, that's that was his the name the white guys gave him when he joined the cavalry. I don't know what his Native American name was when he was stolen by the Apaches, but they called mm -hmm. him Mickey Free. If you ever want to check him out, he's, he's all over the Internet. Um, anyway, this podcast, 
what Alex and I want to do is we'll tell some cool stories. I mean, we have every fucking day there's a new story that's kind of wild, especially if you don't do anything like this. Uh, but also some true crime. We're, we're both into that. So some true crime stories. Yeah, I think I think using kind of using uh, our defendant stories, we certainly have some defendants who themselves have some interesting, interesting stories. And right. uh, so kind of in the true crime spectrum. And, uh, I, you know, I think more than anything, just talking about the human condition and the things that we've learned about uh, our defendants and um, their lives over the course of doing this job for four years. And, uh, you know, it's worth noting neither of us have any sort of, uh, you know, criminal justice or criminology degrees. We All we can offer are anecdotes. But with a lot of these, we have a large number of anecdotes. We have a and huge sample very, size. Yeah, a good, good sample <laughs> size. And um, I, think, I think we just want to talk about some of the things that we have learned and maybe some universal truths that we have discovered right. throughout this process. And uh, maybe have some guests on. Yeah, we have some guests lined up. Uh, through the beauty of the internet, you know, I, uh, I've met some really cool people that I, I chat with and DMs and stuff that are, you know, big wig people, I guess you say, and, and, and they've expressed an interest in coming on and we could talk to them about stuff. We'll do some true crime. We'll talk about some street stories, you know, just funny bullshit that we see every day, man. Just the yeah. w- weird shit that happens in our lives when you're going into someone's life to put them in jail against their will. Um, and like Alex said, the human condition, why are we, why are we, why are these people at this point? Mm-hmm. Um, How do they reach that point in their lives? What kind of decisions do they make on the regular? That sort of stuff. Absolutely. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for us tonight. And, uh, thanks for listening. We have, uh, we're excited. I think this is going to be fun. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it so again just want to say thank you to ben and jason from skill set magazine for inviting us to do this definitely check them out uh skill set magazine it's available in uh books a million barnes and noble major whenever i'm there at barnes like and noble that. i always put their shit in the front <laughs> awesome. I, I take it and i do the fronting with it i'll take it and i put it all over the thing so every magazine on the road looks like <laughs> skill set magazine that's awesome um, i love those guys those are cool yeah. guys and, and and thanks to them for giving us this opportunity man yeah. Um, uh, just in just uh, to kind of finish up here, both of us do have Instagram, yes, and that's we do. the form of social media that we are most active on. Um, we we have Twitch, we have YouTube, we we use them occasionally, but admittedly, um, Instagram is the the it, our go to. Yeah, it's the one that we use most consistently. So check that out. John is unique underscore skill set that's me and mine is wasp and that's w dot a s p you can find us there and then actually uh, i started an instagram account for the podcast and i think we're gonna post some like kind of source material and like uh you know supplemental material on there so follow that that's going to be wanted podcast all one word on instagram That'd be good. Yeah, if you want to see our everyday lives, that's a good window into it. Just mm-hmm. see what we're up to, the defendants. When we start telling some stories, some true crime, like do full episodic kind of case study case things. studies, you'll see. We'll put them in, and we'll line those up on the uh, Wanted Podcast Instagram account. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for listening, guys. Uh, hope to mm. see you next time, and uh, hope you have a. Uh, Good evening. Yeah, thank you so much for tuning in. Again, my name's John and my partner, Alex. On uh, Thanks again. Big shout out to our friends at Skillset Magazine. And tune in next time. See you then.